Our scripture reading today is John 13, chapters 1 through 17, and Matthew 20, chapters 20 through 28. Please stand if you are able. John 13. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew what, that his hour had come to depart from his world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil who had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured the water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no to share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean though not all of you. For he knew that he who was to betray him, for this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Matthew 20, chapters 20 through 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with their, her sons kneeling before him. She asked a favor of him, and he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, you will need to drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father. When the 10 heard it, they were angry at the two brothers, but Jesus called to them, to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord over them and that their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. The last passage that Anna read from was a passage about a mom wanting her sons to be at the right and left hand, right? Um, as we read that passage. I guess mothers will be mothers no matter when or where. They always want the best for their children. And Jennifer is like that. My 13-year-old uh, son, Cole, um, he's beginning to notice girls, and girls are beginning to notice him. And Jennifer is fine with the part where he's beginning to notice girls, but she's not so fine with the part where the girls are beginning to notice him. 
In her mind, that's still her little baby boy, and that be girl better not be messing with her little baby boy. Family, no matter son, mother, sister, brother, even cousins, they've got your back, right? Or at least they're supposed to. Family, they stand up at our weddings, they show up at our never-ending first grade performances, they sit through four hours of graduation. The good ones, the supportive family, they should get some place of honor in our lives, right? Some think that Jesus' cousins, James and John, may have thought that they deserved this honor. We don't know for sure, but it's possible, based on a few passages from the New Testament, that James and John's mother was actually Jesus' aunt. So they would have been cousins. And they wanted to sit beside him. They wanted the place of honor family first, right? Regardless, they were among that inner circle of Jesus's friends, and they were those disciples, and so at least they probably figured they had that inside track, and they liked it. They wanted the honor of being at Jesus's right and left hand. After all, they had supported Jesus and been with him through all these years, but they didn't fully understand Jesus, did they? Ironically, who was it who was on Jesus' right and left when he died? It wasn't his cousins. It wasn't any of his disciples. It was two thieves who hung on the cross. But the question that the disciples had for Jesus it indicated that they still didn't really fully understand him. Because in their minds, greatness was measured by status. They asked, who had the status as the person on the right and left hand? Who had the status of the person in the place of honor? And Jesus said that the most honored place is not at the right hand. The most honored place is the person who serves. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. More than that, service was also a very practical example of Jesus. We heard earlier in John 13 the story of the Last Supper which Jesus and his disciples celebrated and they came for that Passover meal. They were gathered in an upper room, a guest room upstairs, maybe of a wealthy family. We guess that it might have been a wealthy family's home for all of them to gather up there together in that space. In the Gospel of Luke, it records the argument from the disciples about who was the greatest. And it all happened as they were on their way to the upper room. So all of this conversation would have been fresh on their minds. Maybe it was that very argument that prompted Jesus to show them the example of what greatness was really all about. By custom, they probably would have all bathed before the meal, but also that custom was that since they had walked on the dry streets to the upper room, since those dusty streets were pretty nasty, their feet needed to be washed again too. In the culture of that day and even today, feet are considered the most disgusting part of the body. No one would ever want to touch another person's feet. Normally back then that job was left to slaves. No free man. 
would ever willingly touch another person's feet. But there were no slaves present. And to me, that's a little bit of a mystery, since that's a wealthy household, probably. And they should have had slaves around. But maybe they weren't there because they needed help in gathering and keeping that secret because they knew that the authorities were seeking to arrest Jesus. Or maybe the owner of that property had sent away the slaves in order to give them some time. Either way, there weren't any slaves there, and it created something of a crisis. None of the disciples would do it. After all, they had just been arguing about who was the greatest. To do this now, that would admit they were the least. So Jesus did it. The convention of the day was that the table would be a low table, maybe 18 inches off the floor, and instead of sitting, they would lay down on pillows to eat. It doesn't seem like a very comfortable way to eat, does it to you? It doesn't to me. But that's how it was done. Everyone's feet would be out and away from the table. Even today, if you think about it, if someone in your family takes their feet and props them right on the table, what do you say? Get your filthy feet off the table. People got to eat on that, right? Well, the disciples lived this by facing their feet away. And Jesus went around the room and washed everyone's feet. And he concluded by saying, as I have done this for you, do likewise for each other. Service. To serve is to love. And to love is to serve. Service. Service more than anything qualifies us for leadership in the kingdom of God. If we desire to lead in the kingdom, then it must begin with service. Titles and offices and all such at the right hand work do not make a leader in the kingdom. If we desire to be heard and respected, we must begin by not only serving our fellow believers, but also those outside the church. I think one of the most difficult tests for us as believers is how to treat those who serve us. The ability to accept service with humility is almost as difficult as the ability to offer the service freely. Peter might have, been, might have thought that he was being humble in refusing to accept service from Jesus. But I really think he was probably being proud. It was the pride of self-sufficiency, the pride of saying, I don't need anything from anyone else. But as Jesus said, unless I serve you, unless I make you clean and acceptable in God's eyes, you have no part in me. If we think we need nothing, if we think we can do it all ourselves, if we think that we don't need to be served, then we're refusing that relationship with God. That relationship to help us and show us the way. So how do we treat those who serve us? How do we treat those who sit on and wait on us in, as we sit in restaurants or as we're in line in a store? How do we treat people who clean up after us? You know, I've been at some restaurants and some people like to boss around those servers and that wait staff. I'm sure you've seen them do it too. They're rude and demanding and they treat others like dirt. That treatment says a lot about our hearts. Because when we treat people poorly, we're saying, I'm better than you because you have to serve me. 
Do we truly have a servant's heart if we're not willing to receive service? Do we truly have a servant's heart if we look down on those who serve us? Another question is, whom do we serve? Who are we willing to serve? And who are we not willing to serve? It's easy to serve our friends because, well, they expect that, and we expect that. In some way or another, we think, well, we'll serve you back, right? But what about strangers? What about those whom we serve and don't know, or who will likely never be able to serve us back in return? And what about our enemies? Will we serve our enemies? Consider this. Jesus washed the feet of Judas. Judas, who had already betrayed him. And Jesus knew he had already been betrayed. And he still served him the same as the rest. What about us? Would we be willing to serve the one who betrayed us? If we followed the example of Jesus, then we should be. Finally, let's bring this back to the context of our membership vows this morning that we've been studying over the last few weeks. If we are to support the ministries of this church by our service, what does that mean? It certainly means that we should be servants one to another. Jesus said that by our loving service to each other and our community that the world will know that we follow God? Will our community get a glimpse of God's goodness today by the eagerness that we have to serve others during this day of service? Service is the living example of God's compassion. Both the willingness to serve and the willingness to receive service are necessary to have a servant's heart. Today we are to go out into the world, into our community called Corpus Christi, Texas, and serve to be living examples of God's compassion. Go today with a servant's heart, honoring your vow of church membership to uphold the church with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Amen.